welcome back. Let's take a look at this recent game uh, played uh, just yesterday, I believe. Uh, here I was playing the white pieces, um, playing a teammate of some team, uh, Nokia, who our chess club had played against uh, sometimes before and has had some very close matches in the past. Um, yeah, yesterday's match, at least for a while there, was looking close and then uh, wasn't quite so close anymore, but it was still a good match and we all enjoyed it. Let's take a look. Uh, so I play d4. Uh, one thing you'll note is I have this propensity to play everything, and I'm trying to get away from that. I'm trying to just stick to simpler opening systems in general, but also I have this bank of knowledge of things I've played before to draw from because I've played so many different openings. Uh, but in this case, I stuck with um, an opening that I've played before, I think against the same team. I think if I've played his teammate and I did this same opening, um, this being the Grinfeld. So obviously this requires the opponent to pick this set of moves. Um, and one reason I started playing this as white is because as black I have tried playing this opening and it's just been disaster after disaster in many blitz games. I think you can look at my uh, blitz games I've played on Lee Chess trying this out. It's gone poorly. And then I tried it once or twice as black over the board in serious tournament play conditions, and it didn't go much better. Although I think I did avoid losing one game. But yeah, in general, this defense is quite difficult, and you really, really have to know what you're doing in order to be able to play it. And I was quite surprised. Here, sorry, I had forgotten. I know there's moves like Knight of Three. There's like Knight of Three and Bishop E3. And... Um, I don't know at which point you play like H3 if you do play it. I don't think you do that here. I don't think... I've looked at h3 in the past. It seems to be just a loss of time because black is preparing to castle and hit the center very hard very quickly and um, make this queenside expansion that uh, provides an advantage into the endgame. So this can get extremely sharp and tactical and white needs to make sure the center does not crumble while also managing to castle and do whatever else white does with the space advantage. Um, so I played this to try to calm things down, but I I just could not remember like what the move order is, if I'm supposed to put the bishop on some other square. Um, I know I've studied this before, but it's just been so long. So my opponent, I believe correctly, plays c5 here. I was expecting knight c6. I'm not saying it's better. I'm just saying this... I think this is one line. I think queen a5 is a line. I think there might be other lines, but I think castle is also a main line, if I remember right. But then again, it's just been too long. And then here, I was trying to decide between knight f3, which I did play, or like queen d2. Um, which I think I've played against one of the teammates of this um, uh, opposition team before. But knight of three looks like, hey, this protects the center. This allows me to castle. Yes, this could allow bishop g4, and bishop g4 starts to undermine the center, and that gets really scary. But I've reasoned that my king cannot stay in the center. I must castle. And if I must castle, I have to be able to do something to be able to castle. Um, I had also been thinking about, do I play h3 now? But this felt extremely slow. And yeah, I thought my center might collapse. I don't know. Um, again, if they play like queen a5, I think I have this here. I think I've played a line like this before. I don't remember completely. Um... But yeah, h3 looks spooky, but you could play king d2 here to avoid dropping the pawn. But uh, this looks really spooky, and I'm not sure if this survives. 
or rather this might go into the end game with a disadvantage right off the bat so i took a chance to play knight f3 here uh, they played knight c6, which is a nice, calm move in this position. I don't know if it's accurate. Again, I considered h3 and figured this is too slow that I just absolutely need to castle. But yeah, I was burning time on my clock already. Um, not too much time, but the burn had already started. I tend to get in time trouble because I can't remember everything about every opening that I play because I play too many openings. Um... Yeah, and so here I hit quite the quandary because there's a lot of squares the queen can go to. Uh, I think if I play queen d2, I think they just play rook d8. Or maybe if they don't play rook d8, maybe they play bishop g4, intending either rook to d8. I don't know. Maybe this one goes to d8, the other one goes to c8, but there's nothing on the c file if things liquidate. Um, so this... Yeah, this I was not so comfortable with, even though the queen opposing the queen feels kind of nice. It's There's potentially some issues here. Um, I debated like queen c1, queen c2, queen d3. I think queen d3 might run into some issue. Oh, yesterday I was thinking b6, intending bishop a6 looked kind of tricky. But now I see that the rook can't protect the square right now. So b6 seems to be out of the picture. Um, yeah, I don't really know. I think I've had some blitz games like this before, too. And I think it's gone something like a6, intending uh, b5 and c4. I don't completely remember. But I settled on queen b3, even though this allows this obvious same idea. But this time the queen's not opposing a rook on the d-file. This was a tough decision point. Um, there's probably a correct move here. I spent a while contemplating a4 and then backed off and thought, well, what am I doing? Like, this just makes another target and helps them expand their queen side faster. Even if I do get things traded off, this rook still is on the same diagonal as the bishop. This I was not looking forward to, so... Um, yeah, I tried to justify this to myself, and I just could not, even though this seems to slow down their attack, it also seems to make it stronger. Um, so I played rook c1. I just, yeah, it feels like there should be some move here. I don't know if it should be like that, or maybe it should be, um, h3, preventing bishop g4, and but then we run into this, and like, why did I bother playing h3 if the bishop's not going to go here anyway? Yeah, I don't know. So I play rook c1, trying to wait and see what the opponent's doing, but also kind of like preparing rook d1, I guess. Oh, but also this like supports the c-pawn in case I'm crazy enough to try this. Which I'd started thinking about, but it seemed pretty wild. And then after seeing the opponent's move... Oh, the other thing I was looking at is, could I do this? And the answer, I'm pretty sure, is no. I don't think I can do this. Um, and the reason is... Wait, what was it? Wait. Yesterday I was convinced this was not a good idea. Um, hmm. Maybe this is actually... Stupid as it looks, it might be a good idea. Uh, I was spooked. This looked really, really messy. Um, but maybe it's fine? I don't know. I could not figure this out yesterday, and, like, winning a pawn seemed like the least important thing to do in this position. But maybe it's fine. <laughs> Maybe that's a safe pawn grab. Oh, that's right. Instead of rook c8, um, they potentially also have this. Yeah, I had to keep remembering this was a shot here and my bishop's loose. And I can't stir up enough activity to make up for the hanging piece. So, yeah, 
we just play a nice calm move here, um, which probably is wrong, but I could not figure out what's the right move. I mean, even now, I'm very confused. Like, it'd be nice to reroute the knight, but there's nowhere to reroute it to and no target to aim at, as best as I can tell. Um, I briefly considered c4, but this actually just doesn't work. This just loses a pawn if I were to play c4, and it loses it also losing a tempo, so it's not playable here. Um, yeah, I considered bishop d2, but then this happens, and like, why did I put the bishop on d2? So that's not it either. Uh, yeah, this is messy. And among this mess, this seemed to be the only thing that stood out, is that, well, okay, I might not be able to stop the queen side advance, but at least I can secure the d4 square. I've got one, two, three protecting it. And yeah, they have three attacking. And yeah, they could bring a rook, I could bring a rook, but I don't see a way that they could outnumber me here without giving me like an initiative elsewhere. So somehow I think this opening was not a disaster for me. Um, yeah, my opponent played c4, which looks quite natural in many endgame lines. This provides it, makes a huge headache because my king is just outside the square of the pawn. That's going to be a theme. Yeah, e6 happens in many Grunfeld lines. Here I'm not so sure because like their bishops on the same square color as all these pawns. So this confines the bishop to just the long diagonal. The bishop can't go anywhere other than this long diagonal, so e6... I mean, it stops me from easily playing d5 here, but I don't know. Um... Yes, I reasoned after a lot more thinking. None of my knight jumps anywhere. Or, like, if I go to e1, obviously I'm blocking the rook's connection to each other, and the knight can't go to d3 anyway. Um, on c4, the idea is that I'm just going to get out of the way of my pawn, be able to push the pawn, and hope that something positive happens. But, I don't know. Uh, knight e7 is curious. This might be premature. I mean, this is at, basically this is saying that if I play pawn e5, that they're ready to jump right in here. Um, and we'll see momentarily why that might become important. But yeah, they have a plan of landing the knight on a good square. Um, maybe you could finesse this slightly, because you can expect that I'm probably not going to voluntarily play pawn e5. I think you have time for this here, but this might not. The move order might not matter at all. Um, or maybe somehow this is actually better to play the knight first. But immediately the knight becomes a target. So this makes the opponent think about something that they hadn't already... Or maybe they thought about it and just this... That was the way they want it to go. I was kind of expecting f6. Um, and then maybe g5? Probably not, but f6 looks interesting. Forcing my bishop to select a diagonal. There's an obvious downside that now the pawn's on f6 and it's blocking this bishop, but uh, black was kind of cramped anyway. Uh, but this is what I was trying to aim for here, is allow my opponent to cramp their position, and then eventually I can try to untangle my silly knot of pieces. Uh, they brought the queen back, and yeah, I struggled for a move here. Um, it's not obvious what to play, at least not to me. Uh, it would be nice to oppose the queen, but I don't really have a way to do that with the bishop on this diagonal. And I still am expecting that eventually they're going to play something like one of these and kick my bishop. Or, potentially something even worse happens where there's a fork and the bishop drops off. 
So, yeah. I'm not saying either of these things is real, but... <laughs> these are things I had to be concerned about, I think. And I chose, um, amidst this confusion, to just back up the bishop. That way, whenever tactics happen, I'm not going to lose the bishop to some fork. Um, yeah, I didn't really see any good way to use a move here. I'm still threatening to take the knight, but I don't need to take it right away. If they spend a tempo activating their bishop, I play f4, which I guess this is the reason they brought the knight back, so they could play f5 and knight d5. So they play f5. Makes sense, right? They want to use, they want to bring this knight out onto d5. And sure, I'm not such a fan of this. Um, I really, really wanted to take the knight right away, but no. I figured first, I've got time to play this. Let's throw this in, just in case it makes a difference. Yeah, I can still take the knight later. I was just curious. Like, no, I'm sorry. If I take their pawn, they can do either pawn to recapture. But if they play what they played here... I'm not such a fan of this capture. Um, yeah, it allows the knight to move uh, if there's a knight. But uh, I'm not going to let there be a knight if there's a good square for the knight to go to. So, um, yeah, I don't know what you do in this situation. Maybe... I've been quite mistaken. Maybe it makes sense to offer a bishop exchange and protect the knight. I don't know. There's a lot to think about, and I'm kind of rushing through the game. But, like, so, yeah, this moving the bishop out of the tactic, and then, or out of some pawn attack that would protect the knight, this retreat of the bishop allows me to play f4 and be prepared to meet f5 with just some other waiting move. Um, I don't think I directly have a threat here. It would be nice to have one, and I thought about, like, do I take the knight and play pawn e5? Um, let me put that on the board, because it's actually kind of interesting. Uh, but I think here... Um, this is kind of a concern, whether or not a5 precedes it. This does not look advantageous for me, despite the fact that I have the knight. I'm kind of cramped in my pawn structure. It's got some problems. Um, and this potentially looks spooky, but you recognize I'm probably going to be forced to exchange my bishop on this diagonal. And get stuck with an endgame that I just don't like. Like, this endgame looks... Without this... I don't know. Without an attack, this looks like a very difficult endgame. So that's why I just decided to keep activating pieces and keep the tension. Uh, but yeah, here, I think this tension was too much for both of us. And we dissolved it. So I took the knight. They take back. I do knight takes here. Um, yep, so... We already notice, like here, my rook is on a useful line, and my knight is starting to join. If only I had a stronger attack over here, that'd be awesome. But it feels like in this timing there should be something, right? Um, like, they keep menacing this idea of attacking the queen side, and this bishop supports this attack beautifully. They have two beautifully posted bishops, and I was kind of stumped what to do about all that. Thankfully, the e6 pawn is a target. Um, here, my opponent plays queen h4, which I think just loses a move. Um, it looks scary, but it looks like they're trying to win the f pawn, or somehow prevent me from winning the e-pawn, but um, I'm not sure this is the right way to go. Um, I don't know, other than targeting this pawn, I'm not sure what this does, uh, but maybe somehow it prevents me from easily winning the e-pawn. 
Uh, so I briefly thought about like knight c5, which is a fork. Um, and the problem I think with knight c5 is they just step out of the fork. And I haven't really done anything useful with the knight. And I can't bring the knight back to the king's side in one move, so this seems kind of risky at best. This could be even worse than that, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, I just blocked the queen from hitting the pawn. Um, it took me a, a bit to, for, to observe that I could actually just interrupt this line of communication. And there's not a lot the opponent can do about it, because I'm also hitting this pawn. Um, so yeah, uh, the opponent plays this to defend the pawn, even though I didn't move the knight. So you could contrast this with knight c5, where my pieces are not active. Here, my pieces are doing a bit better. Uh, and it might make sense to protect it this way. The bishop is less valuable than a rook or a queen. Um, but yeah, then I hit the pawn again. And actually, I'm hitting it three times. Uh, so this... Yeah... Not only did I protect my f-pawn, but also I'm attacking this. Um, yeah, the queen does still have h6, otherwise we might be thinking about trying to trap the queen. But yeah, I've got this triple attack on the square, which also extends toward the king. And also, like, a knight on the square would hit some targets, too. So this is, like, extremely fortunate. That I have this. Now, if the rook weren't on e1, if this rook were still back on c1, this would just be a double attack. They could defend it. I could try to bring the rook over. They could defend it again. But this triple attack hits really quickly. Um, yes, yeah, so they continue the attack on this f pawn. So I proceed. This is check. This protects the pawn. So, I did not anticipate this in advance, but it's very fortunate that while hitting the rook, I'm also defending. Um, you know, this knight on the sixth row is just kind of a monster. Uh, the opponent attacks it, which seems quite reasonable. Um, and here I sat and thought for a lot. I mean, yeah, you could still see the move in the move list here. You could see what I played, but... Um, it's an interesting position. Um, so I spent a while thinking and realized, well, okay, yeah, the knight's done a great job. It's a beautiful knight. I don't want to give it up. Yeah, yeah this bishop is kind of stuck in the corner. What would be a reason to exchange the knight for the bishop, other than just making the position simpler? Is there any valid reason to do this exchange? Actually, yes. The bishop is on an open board, the better piece than a knight, and this board is pretty open. Uh, but additionally, this knight just... well, it's the same thing. Where is the knight going to go next? The knight's gone and taken stuff already. There's not a whole lot of targets left for the knight to strike at. So, yeah. Uh, it was a tough decision, but I gave my knight for the bishop and then proceed into the end game. So I call this the end game because we both have two rooks, a queen, and a king remaining. And we don't have more pieces other than pawns than that. So we consider this to be early end game, I suppose. Yeah, it's possible there might be a checkmate threat formed somewhere here or there, but we're getting close to exchanging some of the pieces. Um, all right, so then here, I got this far. Well, okay, yeah, they played king g8. This is just a really tough position. Um, at some point, I'd started getting time pressure. How much time did I have remaining here? I sometimes note on the score sheet, I think I had something around 20, maybe 25, but I think closer to 20 minutes in this position for the rest of the game. There was a five second delay as part of the time control, so uh, there's still time to make the moves, but not a whole lot of time to think. So 
um, for an entire game. We've played 27 moves to this point. Many chess games go 40 moves. So yeah, I played this um, and I just started moving a bit faster and faster because I didn't want to run out of time. Um, whether or not we win or lose or draw this, um, yeah, I just I didn't want to have a position where it was drawn or winning and I would uh, run out of time. So I start moving quickly, even though it's a bit challenging to see. There's a lot of options again. They could do like king h8 or they could do king, well, king f8, I don't know. Um, probably not king f8, actually, now that I think more about it. I don't think king h6 is wise, but you potentially could consider it. It does get the king away from the rook for this turn. And they do control the king's side to some extent, so king h6 has some merit. Um, but also exposes the king greatly. And then there's this, which I was kind of hoping for, just because, um, yeah, they do attack the rook, but if I could simplify the position, exchange some pieces, as long as they don't manage to promote on the queen side, then I'm okay. Um, yeah, I'd been informed around this point it was fine for me to accept a draw, so my opponent was trying to play for a win at this point. Um, I think. Yeah, king g8 makes sense, but it's maybe a bit more exposed than king h8. I don't know if it makes any difference. And on h8, potentially, um, maybe I do something like this, where I'm vaguely threatening stuff like that, but I think they're okay. And I think the c3 vulnerability really makes itself known. I think they have time for this here. Um, and if I try to go checkmate them right away, I think I get hit with this. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, the rook's hanging, isn't it? My bad. That's why I wanted to move the rook. Um, yes, yeah, so I was thinking this first. And that I thought they had a way to meet this, too. And it's concerning that this pawn on c3 hangs and this stuff over here is... They, if I don't checkmate them here, I'm in trouble. And yeah, they can back up, and this is kind of double-edged. Um, but the king's not so easy to strike yet right away. Um, anyway, we picked this. It might not make any difference. Here, I noticed that while, or yeah, until they managed to exchange one of the pairs of rooks, um, my rooks actually control a lot of squares. It's kind of amazing just how much is defended by these pieces. So this frees up my queen to go anywhere, because everything I have is protected. And they don't have time to take the f-pawn just yet, even though they keep attacking it. Here they still have to back up again, because I'm threatening the queen. Uh, and then I finally bring the queen out. Finally. Um, yeah, and they play a very reasonable move here, hitting this f-pawn a third time. And I sat and thought a bit more, um, thinking, well, okay, what can I do? It's, it's challenging, right? I was trying first to see, can I checkmate the opponent? The answer seems a pretty resounding no here. Uh, and then I started thinking, okay, what endgame might I prefer to go into? And how do I deal with this threat on the f-file? One idea I briefly looked at was f5, um, threatening a queen exchange and trying to liquidate some pieces. Um, but this endgame did not look good. Uh, yeah, I wasn't sure which way they would take on f5 at this point. Um, but something like this looked kind of difficult to work with. This looks like I'm more likely to lose than to win this, I think. 
if you count pawns, yeah, the pawns are even, but this looks so difficult. Because I have uh, three pawn islands. Yeah, they have three here. It's just, yeah, I don't know what you do. Um, so instead, yeah, I played rook e8. And there's, let's see, the point here is that if they take this, I can take back. And if they take this, I can just take the queen. So that's point number one. But yeah, everything's kind of along this line. That They can't really snatch my pawn here. Um, nor, like, doing this exchange does not make things any easier. Uh, they still don't have time to take the pawn because the king's unchecked and then I can go back and defend it again. So, yeah, they play the reasonable attack continuation, g5. And after some more sitting and thinking, I found this really cool move. And it's not obvious at first what makes this so cool. Um, yeah, how do we explain it? It's point number one. This g-pawn was attacking my f-pawn, right? They take... Then we win this queen. But if that's not cool enough, there was another cool point here. This was super surprising to me that all these tactics exist. So pawn takes us out, but also rook takes us out. Because this check mate. So like, this was perhaps my coolest move of the game. Um... And I don't know what the opponent does here. I think taking the f-pawn is now out of the question. But also, like, this is so... I don't know what you do. I think what they did was reasonable, but... Yeah. It's entirely possible I've missed something pretty fundamental in this position. But queen e7 just seems to solve everything all at once. Which, um, it's hard to believe, but if it does, then it, that's really awesome. Like, if they play rook f7 to try to continue this, I think it's, well, I'd started looking at this. This had me concerned, because they could push here. And this is what I meant by square of the pawn earlier. Oh! I can't count. Oh. Oh. Uh, this is not so simple. Um, wait, so does that mean if they play b4, I can just take it? But the square... Okay, yeah, no, I can't take it. That's the difference. I'd only looked at c takes. But no, if they play this... Wait, but then there's this. I'm still outside the square of the pawn. Yeah. So exchanging all the pieces, getting into this endgame, uh, would have been a big, big blunder. Um, yeah, this gets super dicey. So exchanging everything would be a very perilous. Um, but as long as I don't exchange everything, maybe I'm fine. Like, if I just check here, maybe they block, I just push the pawn. What's going to happen? My rook defends this, and I'm threatening in my own ways. So, yeah, I don't know what... Possibly rook f7 doesn't do any better than what they did. I don't see a good move for them here. If there was stuff like that I had to watch out for. Uh, so this is check. And then, after more deliberation, I just push the f-pawn. And only their rook is attacking this. Um, so if they, like, just burn a tempo doing nothing, I can check and check. Oh, wait, I'm not winning this? I thought this was winning. Hmm. Maybe not. Maybe not. So... Yeah, I don't know. Maybe this f-pawn isn't so menacing. You know, in shogi, if you were to 
if something like this were to happen, and this check and they block, this would be a promoting pawn in Shogi. It would be hitting one of the top three ranks. It would promote and could move sideways too. And so, yeah, like this, or could capture in each direction, move more or less like a king once it promotes. Uh, so in Shogi, this sort of tactic against a rook tends to work quite favorably. It's not the same in chess, and yesterday I thought that like this pawn advancing would be something amazing, and eh, seemingly not. See, so yeah, if they lost a tempo, this would not be instantly a win. I'm sure there's some way I can generate threats here if they just play some way of losing a move. Uh, they actually retreat their queen. Oh, there is a reason to do this. So, yeah, aside from checking aggression, which doesn't seem to do a whole lot, I mean, the other thing to watch out for is pawn g4. And now... They would have to open up the h file for their queen to have a square to move to. This actually ensnares, but does not win the queen. And so then I'd be playing this endgame basically up a queen. Um, or up a queen for a rook. Because my rook's locked in here, their queen would be locked in there. That's only if they play h6, though. And they're not going to play h6. But I'd started thinking about this, and they played queen h6 here. Um, so I wasn't able to immediately bottle up the queen, uh, keep it trapped in a corner forever. I reasoned that my queen is terrible on the edge of the board, it really belongs in the center. Maybe there's other squares it also belongs on, but this one looked fine. Um, yeah, here, again, this looks, uh, challenging, right? Because if I'm a bit reckless, oh, this can't move. Never mind. But still, this uh, maybe it's not so bad. Maybe it's playable. Uh, queen c1 might not refute this. Wow. This position might be better than I thought. Um, yeah. Anyway, having missed that, um, where did we end up? So they played queen h6, they played queen a5, they played g4. I decide I want my rook on an open file instead of behind my pawn. I'm able to influence all these squares on this open file. And I would started thinking about, well, what if they play queen c1? And after queen c1, what if... I'm, I kind of got cut off here, but... Um, yeah, I started thinking about this sort of thing. It's perhaps, this might just be much better for me, but no. Nah. I guess there's no shot here. Yeah, like, even if somehow this were to win the rook, and it doesn't. Um, oh wait, no, if I play g5, this is check. Yeah, they would take the rook with check and then be able to take this pawn. So g5 would be a blunder here. So I just have to move aside. Or potentially queen e7. Ah, yeah. This would be another way about it. So, yeah, this position is just much better than I thought it was. Um, but putting the rook on the open file, again, serves me well. So, they step out of the open file. And now I block their queen. Um, so having blocked... Yeah, the, these moves rook g3 and rook e3 were not easy to consider. Um, so, subtle little trick here is that, say, if they lost a move in some way, I have this check, and this looks crushing. Because, again, the rook can't defend in this kind of shape. So, they'd have to, they'd have to block at the rook, and it would not help. So, yeah, that's if they lose a move here and just do nothing. Or if they were to snap this pawn, ditto. Because uh, even though the root pawn threatens to open up my king, and even though I could take back and allow queen c1 and things get kind of messy, um, yeah, I just didn't want to see any of that. And having this shot on e8 was wonderful. 
Yeah, this pawn really cuts off the rook, so the rook can't stop these sorts of things. So they protect um, all these squares immediately adjacent to the king. Uh, and so I just take the pawn. And this is just winning. So finally I'm able to start to relax. I don't have to worry about these pawns promoting against me in some kind of um, no queen, no rook endgame. There's no longer a way that the queens and rooks can be removed. Uh, so the opponent quite reasonably just attacks at this point, because what's there to lose? How could I possibly do anything here? Uh, but there's one more trick, and there it is. So trick after trick after trick. What were some of the key moments of the game? So, yeah, somewhere around here, trying to figure out, like, since they didn't play bishop g4, how do I try to build a space advantage, but also not, like, make all sorts of holes in my position? Maybe queen d2 was important here, but... Um, so then we had this where I try to win a tempo, try to force them to move back to c6 or play f6 or something to deal with my bishop. Um, but the, the knight's decently posted here. They don't have to go back to c6. And they could try stuff, but yeah, the idea behind the Grinfeld is to attack on the queen side. And it's a really severe attack because I only have these a and c pawn. And they have three pawns they're able to push. But somehow this knight is not anywhere around here. It's trying to defend the king. And in many, many openings, this knight defending the king would be a great idea. Um, but, yeah, losing the knight and giving up the king's shelter is a bit risky. I guess... Yeah, I'm not sure. Like, if you're looking to try a slightly different strategy, I wonder... Maybe something like this might be okay. And with an intention of just supporting the king in this really non-standard way. Uh, they do have the bishop pair, and they could always push on the queen side, so unless I can find some way to break through on the king's side, this is just going to be a wash. Um, yeah, I don't think they've made any blunder to this point, so maybe some kind of thing. But anyway, key points... Yeah, this just spiraled completely out of both of our control. Um, yeah, and then, so it went from this knight being loose, to now there's a loose pawn, but also the king's kind of exposed. And the queen is doing its best, but without the support of an army. The rook's supporting, the bishop's supporting, this bishop is trying, but it can't. Not without these guys hitting the c-pawn. Um... But yeah, so they, the direction of my opponent's attack just got a bit confused. And I was very lucky to have this. And then, yeah, after this, yeah, this is just better for me. I'm not sure how much better. I'm not sure how comfortable this is, because, again, any time we enter an endgame, if all the pieces are exchanged, they just push b4 and my king can't stop these pawns. So I have to be careful not to exchange all the pieces. But, yeah, maybe bearing in mind that I'm not going to exchange everything. This might just be a really good position. Um, yeah, this should feel comfortable. Since I didn't... Like, I'd considered some silly moves like Queen E4 here. Um, and once they protect their rook, I just did not find a follow-up. Although I guess rook f3 might be a decent follow-up. I don't know. But, eh, I don't know about this. It seems like the queen on e4 might not be perfect, even though that's what I played la next move anyway. Huh. It's funny. Thinking about this move first and the other move next, I don't like it. Um, but reverse the move order and stick the queen here and I'm okay with it all of a sudden. I guess because it defends this pawn, and I guess because I have this shot. I guess after this shot, the opponent's attack is just gone. It's sad. 
But yeah, I don't see them having a, an attack here anymore. So how did that happen? How did do we find a tactic that just like completely dissolves the opponent's attack? What was the secret sauce? Um. Yeah, no, I think it's that even though I have some weaknesses on the queen side, their attack fluctuated between the queen side and the king side. They didn't stay focused on one side or the other. And therefore, um, since I had enough pieces to support my attack, it went decently well. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of some way... Oh, right, the other thing I was considering during the game with some lines like this, you'd think, like, what the heck? Why would you do that, right? Because you had such a beautiful bishop, and it attacks toward the king. Why would you even consider this? Um, it's an opposite color bishop endgame. So whoever takes the initiative wins this. And this d-pawn is not perfect. It's only defended once. And if the defender has to move, this could become a huge target. So, potentially, this is contentious. Not sure, like, in actuality how contentious this could be, but... Um, yeah, maybe I get to grab the e-pawn, maybe, but this looks pretty even. Uh, this looks... well, I win a pawn, but it's not the end of the world. But yeah, maybe this was around the time the position favored me heavily. This queen g3 keeps up the idea of attacking this pawn, but, um, yeah, my piece coordination just trumped theirs here. Yeah, this was just too much, so I got lucky. Found a lot of good tactics. Um, so I guess the moral of the story is, even if you don't perfectly know an opening, even something dicey like this, um, it can be okay. Try to play the main lines, you might not completely know them. But each time you do play, you'll learn something from it, and it'll be a good game. If you just try making up an opening from scratch instead of playing something you sort of know, it's going to be harder. But with enough experience, you'll build up knowledge either way. Hope we've enjoyed, and thanks for watching.